Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Vox Vomitus. I am your host, Jennifer Ann Gordon, the author of the award-winning novels Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent and Pretty Ugly, as well as the recently released The Japanese Box and Other Stories. Joining me today, as always, is my Vox Vomitus vixen, my co-hostess with the mostess, Alison Martine Hubbard, author of The Bourbon Books, which includes Dibs, Since September, Move on Melinda, and Climb the Salmon Ladder. Joining us today is Thomas Reed, you can just call him Tom, he told us before the show, author <laughs> of Pocket Full of Posies. Uh, you also have another book that I did not read that I really kind of want to talk right. about. Um, Thomas Reed, welcome to Vox Vomitus. Tell our listeners, our viewers, a little bit about yourself, and then we'll, we'll transition into a little bit about Pocket Full of Posies. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much for having me on. I've really been looking forward to this. And uh, here we are. That's so sweet. Uh, Have you not <laughs> seen the show before? Yes. <laughs> I did. And, I, and I'm still looking forward to it. So you oh, could just, I, I could change my mind completely by the end of the session, but I'm, like, I'm feeling good right now. Like if all of a sudden Thomas has technical difficulties and he's gone, we'll <laughs> okay, just go. You know yeah. what, though? Oh, yeah. Okay. We so we got the notice from FEMA that there will be like a broadcast at 1120. So about 20 minutes into this. Or 220. Yeah, I put my phone in the other room. But if you hear oh, a God. weird high pitch sound, it is not the apocalypse. It is just my school district communication. It should not come on my computer. It'll definitely happen to me because I am recording on my phone because it has a much better camera. Jennifer. Well, we'll see. We'll just we'll play it by ear. We'll, and we'll survive it. it. We'll survive it. Apart. We'll survive just... the fake FEMA apocalypse together. Yes. yes. Thomas, tell us about yourself. So, a little bit about me. Yeah, I was an English professor in my in my prior life. Uh, I started out at Dickinson College as their medievalist and uh, oh, Chaucer. And uh, I just other... got chills. <laughs> well, Chaucer, we love Chaucer. <laughs> That's exactly what happened to my students when they found out they had to take medieval literature. They got chills as well. Um, and, and because they were faking having the flu? That, no, they were they were just reacting realistically they, to the They to really the did like it? because No, they got to like it by the time they lived through the first four or five classes. But the thought of Love having it. to read ancient literature, particularly Chaucer in Middle English, that was daunting for some people. But, but I didn't anyway, do that in junior high. Yeah. I did it in high school, but I, <laughs> junior high seems mean. You were at a Catholic school at that point, huh? Uh, no, I had just gotten to a public school, and but it was a in junior high. It was from a community that was pretending to be a private school. Oh, okay, that's fine. Go on. So <laughs> anyway, okay, there I was doing medieval literature, and uh, Chaucer was my main guy, and another uh, writer named Marie de France. Uh, Laura Graf has actually just written a wonderful novel about her. Came out a couple of years ago, but then I got towards the end of my career, got interested in Victorian literature, and. Uh, in 1990, uh, Valerie Martin came out with a book called Mary Riley, which was about the story of Jekyll and Hyde from the point of view of a maid in, in the household of Dr. Jekyll. And I wanted to read that, but I wanted to read it with a, a kind of full sense of what, what she was working with. So I read for the first time in my life, uh, Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And it kind of took over the last 10 years of my, my career. Uh, I taught a lot of Stevenson at the end. and. Uh, also, in, in uh, researching a scholarly book on Stevenson, I discovered that the novella had been blamed for inspiring Jack the Ripper. And, <laughs> uh, you, you know, <sighs> given Stevenson had written it originally as a kind of warning against a certain kind of extravagant lifestyle, uh, the, the thought that this kind of uh, admonition had been, been uh, potentially a, a prod to somebody murdering prostitutes in the East End of London shocked him. And I thought, man, there's a story there. Uh, so I actually wrote Seeking Hyde about that, about his... How, why he wrote uh, Jekyll and Hyde and what happened after, uh, after he discovered that he'd been blamed indirectly for this series of serial uh, slaughter. And, well, look, uh, I'm sure he never expected it to end up as a musical. I mean, he might have strong feelings no. about that. Too. I know. Like, <laughs> if he could come back now and, like, just, like, look over the musical of it and then mm -hmm. go, yeah. remember when they were mad at me because they thought I made Jack the Ripper and now it's one of the more beautiful musicals that have happened in the last... Redemption arc. Redemption yeah. arc. Who had a musical be... theater? Gonna, next thing you know, they're going to blame Dante. You invented hell. How dare you? Yeah, no, that could well happen. And all this, you know, I mean, review of literature. That could actually happen in our lifetime. Yeah, but Dante's dead, so I think he his... He's fine. He doesn't have to worry about that now. Anyway, so so there I was, and uh, 
that was my first novel and uh, Pocket Full of Posies is the second. And has very little to do with Seeking Heights. So there's definitely some kind of detour going on. So you go from medieval yeah. and, and we go yeah. Chaucer to Robert Louis Stevenson. And then you go from Jacqueline Hyde to Pocket Full of Posies where you've got some mercurial characters, but I don't think any of them were up to that kind of antic where they're turning into other people and murdering folks because... I must not that. that quite, not, not quite that. that far. No, not but you yet. do if have I... a huge cast of characters in this book. It is rather large, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so pocket full of posies. We're gonna ask you for your elevator pitch in just okay. a, a few minutes, but stretch first before I stretch, pitch. stretch, 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 breathe it out. Uh, so, pocket full of posies is drastically different than Seeking Hide. <laughs> um, I, it is. You know, for me, it's a it's a family drama. It's a family comedy. It is a mm -hmm. travel brochure. Hmm. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit of a menu. It's a contemplation of grief and what illness should be for a person who's suffering it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, there was a lot there. I just give ooh, your ooh, elevator and there, pitch. And there are letters, too. So do we get There's to call letters. it, a, I'm going to mess up the word, epistolary? Epistolary. Does it, does it yeah, work? Yeah. I, See, I suppose it, it is. I was not an English lit major, but I still remember the word. <laughs> I know. I'm like, it is epistolary, which I always say the wrong way, too. So I'm always like, oh, no. I know. Yeah, it's not EpiPen. That's, <laughs> that's, a nice, that's a nice generic uh, uh, call that I hadn't really thought of. But And the first English novels were epistolary. So maybe I'm going back to the beginning of things, even before Jekyll and Hyde. So anyway. So yeah, elevator, elevator pitch. Elevator pitch. Uh, uh, it Brian, doesn't have to be ten words. It can be yeah. Brian and Grace. <laughs> Brian and Grace are forty-something twins, uh, and their widowed mother, uh, who's lost their father, her husband, a little bit before the action begins, uh, has uh, been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and she's struggling with it and and not doing terribly well. Uh, really decline in her neurological functioning, and she decides after a heroic struggle that it's uh, her body's way of telling her that it's time to hang it up and and move along. Um, she doesn't necessarily believe in heaven, although she talks to the doctors about wanting to rejoin her husband, hoping that'll make some leverage in terms of getting her into hospice. But uh, anyway, she's she's uh, decided she is getting a message from her body, and so she decides to stop eating and drinking, and uh, she needs Brian and Grace to kind of support her in that. And after some searching discussions and, and uh, you know, a little bit of wrestling with their conscience, they decide that they can do that. And so they're there at hospice as, as their mom dies. She, in, in her last days, uh, arranges for them to take her ashes and the ashes of their father and <laughs> sprinkle them at, at six locations around the globe. And I should it's like, say- It's a grief scavenger hunt, it basically. Really is. It is, yeah. You're leaving and, stuff instead of taking it. Yeah. And let me reiterate that it's a dark, dark family comedy. And it, it's dark because it's about funer funeral matters and it is a comedy. So none of this I will that say, I'm describing. Go ahead. I know it sounds like I just wanted to like burst in and be like, I know people who are listening, they're going to go, this sounds like too sad to right. handle. And and I will be perfectly honest. I went into this and I'm like, uh oh, this is a mom with Parkinson's. My mom has Lewy body dementia, which has Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. symptoms that is a mom who has a cat named jimmy my mother has a cat oh, yeah. named jimmy <laughs> my father passed away uh i was like i don't know if i can you do had this. an unborn twin i had an so, unborn twin there you go this really could have been about you jennifer I, it's in new hampshire it's new hampshire. part of it part of it and, and i didn't so, know you before today so. i know yeah. so what i'm saying is thomas stole my life mm -hmm. and no <laughs> no i know you didn't but so i i better get this. off now and just give you my lawyer's yeah, name and address <laughs> Um, no, uh, you didn't. So, but I wanted to say, like, I went into this thinking it was going to be, like, a, a tearjerker, yeah, yeah. a sob fest. And though there obviously there are parts that make you well up, it is like you said, it is a dark family comedy. Like once they go on vacation, family vacations are wrought with their yeah. own kind of drama. Without Very much little little Miss Sunshine and all little that Miss, some, stuff. somewhere Wonderful between movie. Little Miss Sunshine and National Lampoon's Vacation. That yes. and Mickey yeah. and this is yeah. where I leave you. And there you yeah. go. Yeah. And I don't know if you ever saw the film that was made of Evelyn Waugh's loved one, but there's a little bit of that in there too. Oh, it's sort of mm -hmm. a, kind of a funeral uh, uh, funeral director humor. 
But anyway, there, there they are. And their, their mom has arranged for them to, to sprinkle the ashes around the, the globe. And it is a buoyant novel. I think finally it's, a, it's almost a feel-good kind of thing because it's about a family learning some truths and facing some truths and, and coming together. Uh, but as they're traveling around the globe to these six locations, uh, some of which are challengingly public for, for having yeah. sprinkle ashes, uh, uh, the piazza in front of St. Peter's being one that all- That had such Da Vinci Code vibes. I know. Yeah, yeah, I think- And then right. we find out who the new preferiti is, and this one, <laughs> my brother's the Pope. Yeah. That's in half. But, but she also sends along these handwritten notes where she's telling them things uh, which explain why they're at the various places they are and how her life was unfolding as she was in these various locations. And some pretty, uh, I won't say dark, but some pretty challenging secrets about her life and her relationship to her, her husband, their father, come out. Yeah, I'll the say they're very it. honest revelations. Yeah. And yeah, they're not, they're not so dark, but no. they're, I mean, Look, but the as was adult not children, or Hyde, so just clarify. Yeah, the mother's not Jekyll or Hyde. The father was not Jekyll or Hyde. Uh, but as an adult Jekyll child, to hear literally anything about your parents that is not yeah. already part of your mythology. La, 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 la. And these parents were kind of open about like how into each other they were, especially <laughs> right. mom. Right, especially mom. Especially mom. Um, and the letters prove that. So like. But to hear other things that might go, oh, that's shocking even for mom. Mm -hmm. When you're like trying to smuggle ashes into the Shelley Memorial at Oxford. Right. And then having a discussion, and this is not a spoiler, about the shape of his penis. Yeah. yeah. Shelley's penis. Percy exactly. Shelley's penis. <laughs> yeah. What there kind you of go. research did you do on that, Tom? I mean, uh, <laughs> never what mind. I don't of, want to know the answer to that. That's fine. What kind of research did you say? <laughs> yeah, about about. I only you know, I living. I lived in Oxford for a year, and that's one of the first places had, my uh, my <laughs> friend who had been there a year longer than I took me. He said, "You won't believe what kind of universities this is. They <laughs> they actually have naked statues of their famous graduates." <laughs> and you're like, and, and look at his genitalia. Yeah. And I'll just say, like, so I I've never been. I've been a lot of places, but I've never been to England. So obviously I've never been to Oxford. I'd never seen that statue in person. Mm. I studied it in art history, but I never, mm. my professor didn't talk about the Oxford students painting the genitalia area, no, different no. colors, and then having to scrape it mm -hmm. every time that happens. So the genitalia area might be getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> yeah. Is that a, yeah. is that a, a science fact? Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure anybody anybody's uh, earned their their doctorate in science uh, doing that research. But yeah, it's it's Everybody a fact. Everybody needed the statement. There you go they, for your doctorate. They had to put a uh, they had to put a set of bars between the area that that visitors stand <laughs> and the statue because it was happening all the time. Yeah. Not again. Yeah. When you were living there, were there bars around it, or were yes. you a genital? Okay, I just didn't want to use you a genitalia painter. I was for your say, friends. Were you participating? Were in you this participating of in the? No, no, I was not. And I should say that that Caitlin told me that it's I should not uh, say anything that my grandmother wouldn't want me to to say. So oh, even so if, I'm even, sorry I said genitalia so many. Even times. if I were a genitalia knows what happens painter, on I wouldn't. This show. I wouldn't admit it. And, and <gasps> Candace, of course, chooses now to say, hey, I think that's probably <laughs> responding to the genitalia comment. I know. Yeah. She's just like, this podcast is spicy. <laughs> We're talking about art history, okay? We are. Your yeah. head we out are. Of paint set. And literary it's history. Fine. It's Percy Shelley. And it's a sculpture. It checks off all the smart boxes, well, except and for I've math been, and science. I've been to London, but the only part of London, or the only part of England that I was in that wasn't specifically London was when I went up to Bath. So I obviously mm. didn't know the historical art importance of going to Oxford next time. Obviously that's going on my list right now. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> but Bath is a Bath is a great second choice. That's an amazing place. And if you're, a Jane, if you're a Jane Austen fan, it's it's better to go to than Oxford. So yeah. I just want to go to all of it. Um, so <laughs> so um, Tom, list. just so you know, Allison and I usually try to theme up our outfits to go with the book, but we I didn't, I, we didn't have a lot of Rolexes. So uh, I wanted, wanted to match the cover for obvious reasons, but Jennifer's okay. like, Jennifer wanted to eat Thai food. So I'm going, that's- I almost ate the Thai food that I made for my husband last night, but I did not because that would make a bad interview, but I am wearing a blouse I bought in Italy, not in Rome, oh. but I did wear this on a train in Italy like two days before I got to Rome. I Perfect. say- That's great. 
accounts, yeah. accounts, it does, accounts. Definitely. It's like searching my whole house. I'm just like, what did I do in Rome? And then I'm like, oh, I drank a lot of alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a different kind of interview. I just, just like wandered around going, I'm in Rome. Like every yeah. other American. Please don't do it, that. It's an amazing city, really. It was like overwhelming when all of a sudden I was just like, and I, I, I didn't want to be that American who's just like, oh, my God, it's the blah, blah, blah. It's this. But, but you were because you were drinking. We started drinking early. Too. Yeah. It's going to because I had to use the bathroom at like 8 a.m. And I'm like, let's just go to a bar. Yeah. Tumble but I mean, how many, how many places can, can you actually see modern life functioning, you know, in traffic jams and people honking at each other and then the ruins of an empire, you know, right around the corner? I know. I mean, like we just, had like lunch, like at like a pizza place, a nice pizza place, because it's Rome, uh, but like literally overlooking history. And I'm like, mm. it's weird that I'm eating a pizza. It feels yeah. disrespectful to the ruins that you're just like, it's just pizza. But the people who live there are going, this is just where we live. And yeah. it's just the Americans going like that. There's a, it. when I was living there as a 15 year old, there was a place called the Piazza Argentina. And my parents uh, rented a room in a palazzo nearby. And that, that, Piazza was was full of cats. You know, there were thousands of cats. Just how many just of them were named Jimmy? And they, you know, they were they were reproducing faster than you could uh, blink your eyes. And uh, but the thought that this Rome was now the ruins of Rome were were a kind of breeding ground for for cats was really pretty amazing. I kid you not. The first book I remember reading that I picked out as my favorite book, and I've looked it up. I can't find it since. Was called Michelangelo and the Cats of Rome. I read right. it in second grade. So apparently, this is not a new phenomenon. The cats have been around yeah. since I was in second grade, at least, because it was an old book even then. And but yeah, I, was, I, guess, like, I always when I, Rome with cats, and that's why. Rome, when I travel anywhere, if I have time, my husband and I will just follow a stray cat for like several hours and just see what's yeah. happening. We did that for an entire day in Porto, Portugal, and it was the best tour I've ever had in and my life. Were you on wow. any substances while you did? No. Why are you following cats around? Who so does that? Because they really know where to go, like down little alleys, upstairs. You have to. So like do you think they're on the like... payroll of the tourist board or something no, like they that? Be I mean, I think in certain places they are. I feel like the cat I followed around, uh, Corfu, Greece, definitely was getting paid because uh, I'm like, yeah. did you just bring me to a ticket booth? <laughs> But the cats in Porto just kept going into like abandoned places that we couldn't get in. And we were like, should we just yeah. hang out outside? Don't go into abandoned places just because the cat went in there. <laughs> That's a bad strategy. Well, if a cat takes you by a bathroom every two hours and by a like a cafeteria in between, right. then you know the cat is. is the cat's purposeful. on the payroll. Yeah. That's totally on the payroll. Well, um, as far as I was just going to ask, you talk about the places that you've stayed in or that you've lived. Are all the places that we visit in Pocketful of Posies are all on places that you've visited or lived? Or yeah. is it some of them you've traveled to just briefly? They're, they're all places that I've spent substantial amounts of time in. Yeah. I mean, even Singapore. My daughter taught in Singapore for a couple of years at the American School. So uh, even though that's just a waypoint on the on the Posies journey, it's it's a place that I knew fairly well from having been there for, you know, a stretch of time. Um, so when you were writing this, I don't, so what years were you writing this? Were you writing this during the pandemic when we couldn't go any place? And this yeah. started as like, like places a, in my I head to go play. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I probably was, uh, was sort of vicariously living the experience of movement through the, the world in ways that I couldn't in actuality, mm -hmm. but I was writing, yeah, from uh, 20 through 22, I suppose. Um, with the, the sort of prime time and maybe the first year for the bulk of it. And then, uh, and then the second year, more revision. Uh, Jennifer's well, dis disappeared. Jennifer, I, I can tell you what happened when we talked about the apocalypse, I can hear it happening in the other room. And since it's coming from her phone, she had to mm -hmm. remove herself so that we wouldn't get this really horrible ear piercing thing. Oh, okay. So when she comes back, I'll put her back okay. on. So rather than it's just her, her yeah. emptiness, she was not, she was not ditching out of the interview because I know she's the one who asked the question. She's like, but I wanted to know when this was because we yeah. talked to so many authors who usually they visit the places or they do research in the places and they had to completely change their process during COVID because they didn't mm -hmm. have access to these places or, you know, they, they couldn't go to the place or they wouldn't have access to the documents or any of right. that. No, she's back. Um, we are not the kind usually who have to go places, but Jennifer likes to incorporate it. So I'm adding Jennifer back in. Yeah, Jennifer. Hi, sorry. Hello about again. That. There Hello. we go. So, yeah. No, Thank I told for... the apocalypse happened. We heard the it. The apocalypse yeah. happened. We were kind of planning for it. So 
thank you for sparing us the, the anxiety <laughs> of that. But uh, yeah, I I didn't have to do any research. The only thing I really had to research a little bit was uh, the the train station at the uh, Jungfraujoch in, in uh, Switzerland when they go up to sprinkle ashes up at the you know fourteen thousand foot level. And uh, that I'd gave been me up... anxiety, by the way. Yeah, it's like the heights. Oh. Good. I thought it was supposed to, I think. so. I, Good. I okay. Like I was just like, I don't want to be like, something. I'm blaming you for something. Yeah. No, I, I loved, so like, I don't want to cut you off, but I love that ever, there was like an, a, like a mini adventure every time they obviously had to sprinkle ashes places. Nothing from like happens. Everything yeah, happens. From like, like a, a like a, the problem. some places closed, some are public, some are at yeah. 14,000 feet and the, and yeah. the just sprinkle me in the snow is not as easy as... Right. As mom thought it would be. Yeah, I did an interview with Susan Perabo, who was one of my colleagues at Dickinson, and, and a terrific writer, really very, very good. And and she uh, wrote up some really good questions. And one of them was, I mean, because you got basically the same thing happening six times in a row in this book. You've got six sprinklings. She said, did, did you worry about monotony? You know, and how did you keep that from happening? And uh, you know, it's a real that was probably the biggest challenge in the book. And and the the bad weather conditions in two of the two of the instances, and then the frighteningly public necessity of sprinkling ashes right in the middle of St. Peter's, you know, the biggest tourist attraction in almost the Western world. I know, when, were, you, when you listed that as like, this is where they're doing it, and I was just like, how is that? And this is obviously like, this is not a spoiler, but like, you know, talking about like, we've got to maybe put them in our pockets. Right. Literally. That's the, the great Literally. escape. Yeah. I know, the great escape. I was just like, oh. No, they're yeah, not just, doing that. Just for your viewers, that one of the characters gets the idea that they can emulate the prisoners of war and the Great Escape, where they they put the dirt that they're excavating their escape tunnel uh, by removing, trying to get it out of the, the the dormitory, so the guards don't know it's there. So they put it in their pockets and pull a little string, and the dirt goes down their pant leg, and and they just walk back for another load. And one of the characters thinks that would be a great way to to get rid of ashes <laughs> in St. Peter's. And uh, it leads to the joke about up to your leg and in your leg hair. If you're, yeah. if you're Ryan, I'm like, oh, no. Well, you wouldn't. You wouldn't want to be sweating, would you? I mean, you want to no. Sort of I was gonna say, like, you. when I've been in Italy, it was quite warm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But that's where the the title actually came from: "Pocket Full of Posies," because Frank and and Cindy Posey would have been in there if that was the sprinkling uh, mechanism. And honestly, when I when I was sort of brainstorming this with a, a guy who was actually taking care of my mother, who was in the last stages of her life. Uh, he sort of thought of that as, as a, an opportunity for somebody to see this guy trying to get the ashes out of his pants and, like, and what sort is of that questioning him on that, you know, what's going on here. Nothing. But that, you know, thinking about that scene uh, and, and the kind of dark humor that would be epitomized there really gave me my key as to what the book, the whole tone of the book would be. I mean, it would be it would be this very poignant moment, but that had <laughs> hilarious elements to it. And uh, that and really, my mom's er in my pocket. Everything right. else is just trying to trying to write a book that would would hit that that tone. Well, I will say, um, have you ever seen the movie The Big Lebowski? Yeah. yeah and there's like absolutely. a scene where they're scattering ashes and they blow all over somebody's right. face. So this yeah. happened in real life to somebody I know, and they were having a very mm. somber moment scattering ashes. And this was the, their family's favorite movie. They watched it weirdly every yeah. Christmas. And they were like right. on a mountaintop and the ashes scattered and that happened. And they were like, she's here. Yeah. She, she's she here. did this to us. And then they all laughed. Yeah. And then like went and got drunk because they were like, I, that's what, that's the sign. Yeah. That's, I mean, that is not an uncommon experience. And, and one of the things I had to do for research was sort of Google uh, ash sprinkling accidents. Oh, no. uh, yeah. I was going to ask if you'd actually you know, if part of this was, big. I think some of this is kind of based on things that have happened to you, but I don't think you've had yeah. a worldwide ash sprinkling. No, no, I haven't. Uh, although I. Well, just... when Allison and I die, we will, um, we will leave that to you and your family. No, I'm doing yeah. Neptune Society. I just like the name. My wife thinks there ought to be a, a sort of travel agency that specializes in things like this, you know, transglobal, circumglobal ash sprinkling. Um, even just even just in the United States, because I'll say my father passed away. My mother is not doing well. And even she's been like, what I would like is for you and your husband, Roman, to bring dad and I all down the East Coast on the same route that like we used to take hitting all the beaches to get to Miami, which is where she grew up. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, 
um, I don't really want to take that trip, but I definitely I will. I don't want to go to Florida. Yeah. <laughs> We've actually, my wife and I have discussed uh, getting our children. I have a son who's uh, 31 and a, and a daughter that's 35 um, and getting them actually to sprinkle our ashes perhaps in the same places, right? Because we've been to all those places and that would be a story, you know? That, then, they, <laughs> then it becomes a book within a book within a book. Ooh, yeah, absolutely. Very meta. I love yeah, it. It's, it's like all of a sudden it's Inception. Yes. Yeah. Just goes on yeah. forever. Yeah. But no, it's good. Okay, so as far as weird first jobs, I my first job was at a swim school. My second was at a funeral home. And mm. the fact that so many people don't talk about prearrangement, I love I love that we're bringing up the topic and that people are having these discussions in their life so that when things happen, people know the ridiculous places they're supposed to sprinkle the ashes. And right. probably the reason that travel agency can't work is most of the places are illegal. Like you can't arrange for something to be done that is not legally able to be done and can only be done by subterfuge and like well i was i was actually surprised you're you're right there's some places that don't allow it but i was surprised at the Disneyland. number of places that do uh <laughs> and you don't need special permitting it's it's actually harder to, to travel with the ashes than it is mm. to actually deposit yeah i thought anymore. that was actually very interesting the the parts where you talk about and again this is not a spoiler because we everybody knows that are traveling with ashes mm. but like the kinds of containers that they can be yeah. in the paperwork you need yeah. um I mean, which again led to like some hilarious moments yeah. in the in the book. <laughs> that I mean, I maybe mean, well, I mean, probably not that... hilarious for them happening to them, but as a reader, I'm like, oh, that does suck. Right. <laughs> no, there there are scenes like that, and I I one of my favorite scenes is when when uh, Grace has to call Tuttle's funeral home and arrange for the ashes to be to be shifted over, and it, you know, if there's any any scene in the book that that I really owe to Evelyn Waugh and The Loved One, which is a marvelous satirical novel. It was written in the 50s, I think. It's that one. That's the, the funeral director who uses the phrase loved one over and over again is uh, right out of that. And then, of course, when he gets a head cold, the loved one becomes a loved one. <laughs> the loved one. Very much. Very, Poor very departed much. loved one. Uh, um, so how long did it take you to write this? You might have said that when uh, the world was ending and I got booted yeah, off of the podcast. Um, I was working on it pretty steadily for 10 months to a year. Uh, and then... Uh, That's not I, long. Like, this it seems like such an epic book to me because there's so many characters and so many locations and so many scenes. Right. Remember, he got to go to all these places first. So it's like your life was the research for all this. Did, you said, well, I didn't have to research this because you already lived it. And this right, is and why I set one of my books in Italy in the exact same train route that my characters did because I'm like, already got I that. have all of that memory. Yeah. Every the train only, I miss, my characters miss. The <laughs> only place I con contemplated using that I that I haven't been was uh, Piazza San Marco in, in Venice because uh, I have this secret hope that somebody's going to say, man, this is going to be a great story to make a movie of and we've got all these <laughs> international locations. It's going to be just like James Bond, except with ashes Ex and oh, no guns. And family. You know? No so, guns and just family drama. Yeah, and like but but I but I hadn't been to the to, to Venice at all. And I thought, no, I'm just going to go with the place that I know. Um, and, and so it was Rome. Uh, but it would have been fun if I throw it in one destination that, that I actually had to research and, and then I, go to. Like, cause I bought my blouse in Venice. Oh, it wasn't in Venice. Yeah. It wasn't well, Venice. If, they, if then they do do the movie, you get to go back to all the places and it's yeah. like, this is your life tribute. Yeah. to one. And in many I ways, hope, you, you, you I, start being, go ahead. I, I hope if, if I get a movie, they don't try to do it on the cheap at like Disney world or something. And just <laughs> it's Epcot. Epcot. <laughs> it's Epcot. It's terrible. It's Epcot. It's also um, like, <laughs> parts of weird zoos that they're like it's singapore yeah. land and you're like, oh, yeah. or vegas where it's like that's the eiffel oh, tower yeah. no it's go. not oh my god well but there is a funny. fake venice like, and if they're like imagine? maybe mom won't know we're not going to these places let's just go to vegas and they hit okay well you know epcot is eiffel tower this is mgm grand that's kind of the same and yeah. luxor is just like going to egypt did mom want to go to egypt ah it's fine she'll like it. it's the pyramid it's for the dead it's good it's all good but like as far as a movie goes, we talked about it being well. It's it's like these different things, and it's like a scavenger hunt. But it's also this this pilgrimage and this tribute mm -hmm. to the life mm -hmm. that she lived, and all of these things. And some of them are things they knew about, and some of them are things that she did not share with them. Um, right. Where did you draw the inspiration from for that stuff? Like, were there things that you found out about your family later than you maybe have wanted to, and go, oh, mm. 
Interesting. Thanks for who was at Woodstock in your life? Yeah, yeah. you know, I almost was at Woodstock, and I I didn't go. There there are hundreds of thousands of us, you know, in our seventies now in this country that had the chance to go there and didn't. Uh, I didn't I was, know it was history. I think I was doing something with the camp, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's it's my blessing and my and my albatross both. But uh, no, really, I don't I don't think there's anything in my family, uh, at least that my grandmother and lawyer would let me talk about that uh, that. I love that you specifically named grandma on this. This is like the second yeah. time you've been like, Girl, and then grandma listening. wouldn't that, let that's me. <gasps> that Caitlin left me under strict instructions to keep my grandmother always in mind. Um, exactly. But no, I think there's so many, um, there's so many ways in which when we imagine leaving this world, we review our lives and, and there are things that we have done that we either do or don't tell other people about. And, mm -hmm. and, if there's any kind of uh, educational value in, in our failings, uh, we have to decide whether to pass them along or, or not. <clears throat> and if we worry that they might affect how people think of us uh, after the fact, um, that's a concern as well. But, um, you know, I'm not recommending that every every funeral speech have a, a 5% section, <laughs> on, you know. Isn't this person wonderful, 95% perfect. And then for the 5%, you know, realistic flaw, here we are. Well, yeah, um, and, and they're realistic flaws. Nothing in your sure. book is like shocking or salacious. Yeah. Um, I just like loved Cine so much because I just mm. felt like, like that's who I would want to be. I don't have children, but I would want to be like embarrassing them. Like your dad and I did this yeah. and have them be yeah. like, like in a beautiful garden in <laughs> Italy, just going and like we reading a letter like, and being like, mom, yeah. this is and why they is, drank I mean, so much on the trip. Embarrassing you from beyond the grave. I love it. That dynamic of the of the daughter who's a little more squeamish and the son who's a little more accepting. That I borrowed that from my children. Actually, my my uh, my my daughter's a wonderful person. Looks at the world four square. You know, has no illusions about anything. But she's just a, a little uh, less willing to think about uh, her parents, for instance, and and, and right the, and, and how movie. they were made. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> should, what Caitlin could have said is, "Don't say anything your daughter wouldn't want you to say." That's probably better. <laughs> well, and, and as, we, as better. we know, so Regina would like to see this as a movie done in stop motion, shoebox dioramas, but just for the set, and she would like Wes Anderson to direct. And I, I get oh, behind man, that. Yeah. Movie oh I'm my a gosh! Huge Wes Anderson fan. That would be huge great. West yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm sort of who we're going to cast but we could just go like so long as Wes Anderson directs we will give him the choice and it's always I, like even seven actors anyway so can I toss Greta Gerwig in there as a possible director yes. too yeah. in it or directing it because she could she could do either, she could do either. Yeah, yeah she could do either and she, and Greta could play Grace actually I was going to say uh, she'd be yeah. a great Grace yeah and uh, obviously yeah. a beautiful yeah. director I also have the, the Gyllenhaals in mind as Brian and Grace <gasps> I think they'd be terrific oh they, they were brother oh. and sister and they mm -hmm. could be twins. Almost. They could be yeah. twins. Oh, yeah. A lot yeah. alike. But they're not yeah. twins. They're close so, to age enough, though. They're, yeah. and I, I think, you know, Cindy could be Sissy Spacek and... Uh, um, uh, not that name? you've thought about it at all. Yeah, Jenny, like, not thought about it, but we're like, we get whipping out the list. With the Jenny Spacek. Ortega yeah. is Sage. Sa Sage, <gasps> I, I loved. I mean, I, I didn't think she was going to be a good character at all. I thought she's going to be like a a thorn in the side and she turned into a pistol. She really turned into a pistol. I will say, um, and this is like a, such a compliment to, to your writing and the character specifically. I was like, Oh, Sage at first. I was like, that's a lot for me to deal with. And then yeah. I was like, Oh, everything she's saying are the things like I do and say. And then I was so like, Oh, I see. Yeah. Reflect yeah. on yourself, Jennifer, yeah. where you're like, Okay. Yeah. Her interactions with um, Jack, especially, mm -hmm. I love so much when she's like, check your privilege and that's homophobic. And he's just like, yeah. oh, I'm talking about his watches. Yeah. No, they, they <laughs> I, I love the fact that they developed the relationship they did because uh, he. Did he you helped... expect that going in? No, not at all. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't think either character would be at all deep. And, and I didn't expect them to have this relationship. And, I did and, not uh, love writing deep characters, and yet. Yeah, but but I mean, she she I think will finish her life with an openness towards men uh, that she would never have had if she hadn't been with Jack. She, she has a father finally in Jack that she never had with Fred Bachman, who's one of the great creeps. 
that I've ever conceived of. Uh, but <laughs> I like but, uh, inspiration for that one. Yeah. Don't answer that. But Sage, uh, you know, she just she's a spunky person, and she just kind of took the took the thing over. And when she writes that poem at the end, uh, and you and you said she would be Jenna Ortega. Yeah, that makes sense. No, I can I can see that in Less Wednesday and more who she was in you. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like why are you unsupervised again? What is happening here? Right. <laughs> this is, this yeah. is probably not good. Yeah. So before we finish up. Tom Thomas, are you mm. working on anything now? I'm going to call you Tom Thomas. I know. Her. I that's okay. Um, Thomas Reed is where we need to look for the book. Thomas Reed, yeah. Like so Tom when you, it's like Thomas Reed, that's his website. That's everything. That's. Yeah. Um, I I have a couple irons in the fire. Um, I am a medievalist, and I, a couple of years ago, finished a translation of a, of a, a 14th century poem, uh, Sir Gawain the Green Knight, <gasps> which actually. Uh, we it, just it, saw it, the movie. It was the Dave Patel movie is, yes. is uh, ba based on it, but I did a translation. And if I were able to find an illustrator that that really could do kind of oh. top of the line. Like an uh, illustrated manuscript with illuminated. Yeah, I would, oh. I'd be interested in doing that. Um, I, my, my. I, we just want uh, that to tell back, sorry. <laughs> like a a kind of mountaineering, mountaineering ghost story uh, that I published a couple of years back that I think could be a, a nice short novel. Um, and then I have a, an idea about a, guy who's retired and is doing a long walk uh, and people from his past join him for various sections and that would provide some opportunity for uh, a kind of another retrospective uh, on life but then i'd need something happening on the way you know there'd have to be some kind of dire threat uh for all the people walking uh like giant ants or something i was giant just saying inspiration ants. from our show the the apocalypse was happening during our show the the, the, the test of the least, apocalypse was happening it was just an apocalypse True. test i mean can i just ask jennifer really quickly i i loved uh, the, what i've seen of your victoriana stuff i'm just oh as curious gosh. as to why that why uh, that exists why that gripped you yeah <laughs> oh i know why did that happen did that um so i've always been very weirdly obsessed with old paper, old photos, mm. um, ephemera in all its ways. I did go to school for theater. So I've had like this long running fascination with silent film actresses and like late Zigfield Follies mm. and vaudeville actresses and actors. Uh, so yeah, I started back in 2004, I think making mixed media artwork, photo transfer, paintings, old burned out wallpaper, a weird yeah. things and I just like made some so yeah so everybody who like I never talk about this on the show but I do have a coffee table book called Victoriana which is a collection am, of my anybody work. Sees me moving it's because I am posting the link in the comments oh my god you're so sweet we don't we usually don't talk about it okay it's just posting Thomas Reed instead that's not what I told us that's it. okay no but I, it's I mean, one of those it's one of those things where we think of you as an author with words but you also use other media and that's definitely one of those things where you always say oh i'm the author of these things and you don't mention victoria and i'm not like oh and then i did and this without, yeah. without other and i always feel like it's like part like kind of part of a different life but but a it's lot all, of like the format though they're all it's you know it all informs each other and if you bought my book Victoriana and read the titles of a lot of the pieces you would go oh these are kind of lines that worked themselves into mm. my first debut novel Beautiful Frightening and Silent because I took a lot of my poetry and made those the titles of my artwork and then a lot mm. of that poetry turned into my book Beautiful Frightening and Silent. Yeah. Now I got the link there. But yeah, yeah. when you asked like what Victoriana is, I realized people wouldn't necessarily even know what we were talking about. I'm like, I know, unless they like, like stalk my website. Which they probably should. It's a nice thing. I just, I, I mean, the two ends of my academic career were, uh, I got into film at the end as well, but medieval it went in and Victorian at the other. And I sometimes wonder why those two periods appeal to me. And I, the only thing I've been able to come up with is that there were both periods where there were very, very strong codes of, of proper conduct. Yeah. Uh, proper conduct. And did. also like um, this weird like undercurrent too exactly. of the, the future yeah. is literally right there. Yeah. And strange obsessions with death, like as a yeah. horror writer, there's that in me. But where does, you know, where does the hide go when the Jekyll is particularly strong? I mean, those are the, those right. are the things that really attracted me to the, to the Middle Ages and, among the things and, and also Victorian culture. But yeah, the Victorian age was fascinating. 
if I had to live in another time, that might be it. I might go back to like, 18. you know, I always say that, but then I'm like, would you I would really die want? so fast. I would die so yeah. fast as like I a severe I would. asthmatic. I would be like, I know. I'd be like Just, negative 30 years from now. <laughs> stay away from rats and dark alleys. And, you know, I think that's all they had. <laughs> you were doing full on the cat tour. They're taking you down the dark alleys. So. Yeah. Don't if I follow the cats. Like that. that just leads to fleas, leads to everything bad. All the plagues. All the plagues. All the plagues. Uh, Thomas Reed, you have been amazing. Thank you well, for I've, being here with us I've today. I've really enjoyed it. It thor thoroughly enjoyable. Thoroughly enjoyable. I love that. Um, so next week we have David Scott Hay. Correct. I'm like, I just want to make sure I was getting the, yes. the name yeah. right. And his book is called NSFW, which means not safe for work. And I haven't started oh, it yet. Not. Allison, you have. You said <laughs> it it's a not. techno horror novel. Mm. It is written in such a style that I have I really know. seen. So it's it's long, but it's a fast read because it uses a lot of um, negative computer space. code. Computer, not even. Thank you. It's not written in binary because I. Could not. I know. I'm like, uh oh. It's Linux. What? I don't, I'm probably not even using that. It's JavaScript. No, but it uses a lot of negative space and it's very narrowly written, so you may only have a little bit per. So it won't take that long to read. Interesting. But don't try to binge it because you will probably need time to be processing what you read. I'm just putting it that way. Got it. That's all I'll say about that for now. Awesome. Well, we will be talking about that next week. Thomas, thank you again. Everybody who is watching this live or on the replay, pocket full of posies. Thank you so kind much. Kind of shiny. Very thank good. You, if you want a worldwide romp about grief and ashes spreading that's hilarious and sad? <laughs> this is Wonder it. This wonderful is it. summation. That's great. I know. I'm like, it's a lot of the things I like in this world. Hilarious, sad, travel. Yeah. Great. Thanks <laughs> so much. Sad, travel. <laughs> Thank bye bye. You. Bye.